But yes, let us continue with the Count of Monte Cristo. Chapter 34. An Apparition. France had found a compromise that would allow Albert to reach the Colosseum without passing by any antique ruin, avoiding a gradual approach that might deprive the Colossus of a single cubit of its massive proportions. This compromise was to go down the Via Sistina, turn due right at the Santa Maria Maggiore, and take the Via Urbana, past San Pietro in Vincoli, to the Via del Colosseo. There was, not, there, there was an additional advantage in this route, which was that it would not at all distract Franz from the effects of the story which Signor Pastrini had told them, and in which his mysterious host from the island of Monte Cristo had made an appearance. So he was able to sit, resting, in a corner of the carriage, and to consider the endless succession of questions that had arisen in his mind, though without finding a satisfactory reply to any of them. Something else, as it happens, had brought his friend Sinbad the sailor to mind. This was the mysterious relationship between bandits and seamen. What Signor Pastrini said about Vampa taking refuge on the fishing boats and smugglers' craft reminded Franz of the two Corsican bandits whom he had found dining with the crew of the little yacht, which had gone out of its way and made land at Porto Vecchio solely in order to put them ashore. The name which his host on Monte Cristo had given himself, spoken by the proprietor of the Hôtel de Londres, proved that he played the same philanthropic role on the coasts of Piombino, Civitavecchia, Ostia and Gaeta as, as on those of Corsica, Tuscany or Spain. <clears throat> and, as far as France could remember, he had himself spoken of Tunis and Palermo, proving that he operated over a wide area. However powerfully all these ideas occupied the young man's mind, they vanished the instant he found himself confronted with the dark and massive spectre of the Colosseum, through the openings of which the moon was casting those long pale rays of light that shine from the eyes of ghosts. The carriage halted a few yards from the Mesa Sudans. The coachman came and opened the door. The two young men jumped out and found themselves confronted by a guide who seemed to have sprung up out of the earth. Since, from the one, since, the one, the, since the one from the hotel had followed them, they now had two. In any case, it is impossible in Rome to avoid this over-provision of guides, apart from the general one who takes charge of you as soon as you step over the threshold of the hotel and who does not release you from his clutches until you step outside the city. There is a special guide attached to every monument, one might almost say to every fragment of every monument. So you can well imagine that there was no shortage of them at the Colosseum, that is to say at the Monument of Monuments, the one of which Marshall said, Let Memphis cease to boast of the barbarous marvels of its pyramids, and let them sing no more of the wonders of Babylon. Everything must give precedence to the vast labour of the amphitheatre of the Caesars, and all the trumpets of praise unite in admiration of this monument. France and Albert did not try to evade this tyranny of the guides, something that would in any case have been all the more difficult, since only guides have the right to visit the Colosseum by torchlight. So they offered no resistance and yielded to their controllers, as it were bound hand and foot. France knew the walk, he had done it ten times already. But since his less experienced companion was stepping for the first time into the monument of Flavia, Flavius Vespasian, I must say to his credit that he was highly impressed, in spite of the ignorant chatter of his guides. Anyone who has not seen it can have no idea of the majesty of this ruin, its proportions doubled by the mysterious clarity of the southern moon, the rays of which give a light resembling that of a western sunset. So hardly had the thoughtful Franz taken a hundred paces beneath the inner arches that, than he abandoned Albert to the guides, who were unwilling to give up their inalienable right to show him every inch of the lion's pit, the gladiator's box and the imperial podium, and slipped away by a partly dilapid dilapidated staircase. Then, allowing the others to continue the usual course round the ruins, he simply went and sat at the base of a column, 
facing a hollow depression which allowed him to take in the full extensive majesty of the granite giant. He had been there for about a quarter of an hour, seated, as I said, in the shallow shadow of a column, and lost in the contemplation of Albert, who, accompanied by his two torchbearers, had just emerged from a vomitorium at the far end of the Colosseum, and with them, like shadows pursuing a will-o'-the-wisp, was descending step by step towards the seats reserved for the Vestal Virgins, when Franz thought he heard a loose stone tumbling into the depths of the, depths of the building from the staircase opposite the one that he had just taken to reach the place where he was sitting. No doubt there is nothing exceptional here in a stone coming away beneath the foot of time and rolling into the depths, but it seemed to him that on this occasion a man's foot was the cause and that steps were approaching him, even though the person responsible for them was doing his very best to muffle them. And, in effect, a moment later a man appeared, gradually emerging from the shadows as he came up the staircase, the opening of which was in front of France and lit by the moon, though its steps receded into the darkness as they went down. It might be a traveller like himself who preferred solitary meditation to the meaningless chatter of the guides, so there should be nothing surprising in the apparition, but from the hesitant manner in which he came up the last few steps, and the way that, once he had reached the landing, he stopped, seemed to be listening for something. It was clear that he had come there for some particular purpose, and was expecting someone. Franz instinctively did his utmost to meld into the shadow behind the column. Ten feet above the level on which both of them were now standing, there was a round hole in the vaulted roof, like the opening of a well, through which could be seen the sky, bestrewn with stars. This opening had quite probably been letting in the moonlight for a hundred years, and around it grew bushes whose delicate green foliage stood out sharply against the soft blue of the sky, while great creepers and huge bunches of ivy dangled down from this upper terrace and hung below the arched roof like trailing ropes. The person whose mysterious arrival had attracted Fran's attention was standing in the half-light, so that it was impossible to distinguish his features, but not so much as to prevent one seeing his dress. He was wrapped in a vast brown cloak, one fold of which, thrown over his left shoulder, hid the bottom part of his face, while the upper part was concealed beneath his broad-brimmed hat. Only the outer part of his clothing was lit by the glancing ray of moonlight through the opening in the roof, and it showed a pair of black trousers, elegantly framing a polished shoe. Clearly the man belonged either to the aristocracy or at least to the upper realms of society. He had been there for some minutes and was starting to give visible signs of impatience when a slight noise was heard on the terrace above. At the same moment a shadow passed in front of the light and a man appeared, framed in the hole, staring intently into the darkness beneath him. Seeing the man in the cloak, he immediately grasped a handful of the dangling creepers and hanging ivy, let himself slide down them, and, at about three or four feet above the ground, leapt lightly down. He was dressed in the pure costume of Trasavere. "'Forgive me, Excellency,' he said in Roman dialect. "'I've kept you waiting. Even so, I am only a few minutes late. Ten o'clock has just sounded at St. John Lateran.' "'You are not late. I was early,' the stranger replied in pure Tuscan. "'So, no apologies. "'In any event, if you had kept me, kept me waiting, "'I should have guessed that it was from, for some unavoidable reason.' "'You would have been right, Excellency. "'I have just returned from the Castel Sant'Angelo, "'and I found it very hard getting to speak to Beppo. "'Who is Beppo?' Beppo is an employee at the prison, to whom I pay a small sum in exchange for information about what goes on inside His Holiness's castle. Ah, I can see you are a man of foresight. What do you expect, Excellency? One never knows what may happen. I, too, might one day be caught in the same net as poor Peppino, and need a rat to gnaw away the meshes of my prison. So, briefly, what did you learn? 
There will be two executions on Tuesday at two o'clock, as usual in Rome at the start of an important holiday. One of the condemned will be, uh, will be Masolato. This is some wretch who killed a priest who had brought him up. He deserves no pity. The other will be Decapitato. That is poor Peppino. What do you expect, my dear fellow? You inspire such terror not only in the papal government, but even, even in the neighbouring kingdoms. They are absolutely determined to set an example. But Peppino does not even belong to my band. He is a poor shepherd who has committed no other crime than to supply us with food. Which undeniably makes him your accomplice. But they are showing him some consideration. Instead of being beaten to death, as you would be if they ever caught you, he will merely be guillotined. In any event, this will vary the entertainment and they will have something for everyone to watch. <clears throat> Quite apart from the entertainment which I am planning and which no one expects. My dear friend, said the man in the cloak, forgive me for saying this, but I suspect you may be preparing to commit some act of folly. I shall do everything to prevent the execution of a poor devil who finds himself in this pass because he helped me. By the Madonna, I should not I should consider myself a coward if I were not to do something for the poor boy. And what do you intend to do? I shall deploy twenty men or so around the scaffold, and as soon as they bring him, give a signal. Then we shall leap on the escort with daggers drawn and carry him off. This plan seems very risky to me, and I honestly believe that mine may be better. And what is your plan, Excellency? I shall give a thousand piastres to, excuse me, to someone I know, and shall succeed in having Peppino's execution delayed until next year. At that time I shall give another thousand piastres to another person, whom I also know, and have him escape from prison. Are you sure this will work? Pardieu, said the man in the cloak in French. I beg your pardon, said the Trasteverian. What I mean, my dear fellow, is that I shall do more by myself with my gold than you and all your people with their daggers, their pistols, their carbines and their blunderbusses. So let me do it. Willingly, but if you should fail, we shall still be ready and waiting. Be ready, that's up to you. But you may be sure I shall have him pardoned. Tuesday is the day after tomorrow, so beware. You only have tomorrow. Yes, agreed. But there are twenty four hours in a day, sixty minutes in an hour, and sixty seconds in a minute. A lot can be done in eighty six thousand four hundred seconds. How will we know if you have succeeded, Excellency? Simple. I have rented the last three windows in the Café Rospoli. If I have obtained a stay of execution, the two corner windows will be hung with yellow damask, but the middle one with a red cross on white damask. Perfect. And how will you deliver the pardon? Send me one of your men, disguised, a pe disguise a, disguised as a penitent, and I shall give it to him. Dressed in that way, he will easily get to the foot of the scaffold and pass the decree to the head of the Order of Penitents, who will give it to the executioner. Meanwhile, have the news given to Peppino. We don't want him to die of fear or go mad, because in that case we would have been to a lot of needless trouble and expense on his behalf. Listen, Excellency, said the peasant. I am deeply devoted to you, you, kn you know that, I suppose. I hope so, at least. Well, if you can save Peppino, it will be more than devotion from now on. It will be obedience. Careful of what you are saying, my good friend. I may perhaps remind you of this one day, because the day may come when I shall need you in my turn. Well then, Excellency, you will find me in your hour of need as I found you at this moment. Even if you should be in the other end of the earth, you only you have only to write to me, do this, and I shall do it by my... Hush! The other man said. I can hear something. It's some travellers visiting the Colosseum by torchlight. There would be no sense in letting them find us together. The guides are all informers and they might recognise you. Honourable though your friendship is, my dear friend, if people knew that we were as close as we are, I fear that my reputation might suffer from it. 
So, if you do obtain the stay of execution, the middle window will have a damask hanging with a red cross. And if you fail to obtain it, the yellow hangings. And in that case, in that case, my good fellow, feel free to exercise your dagger. I give you my permission and I shall be there to see it. Farewell, Excellency. I am counting on you. Count on me. With these words, the Trasaveren disappeared down the stairway, while the stranger, wrapping his face still more tightly in his cloak, passed within a couple of yards of France and went down into the arena by the outside steps. A second later, France heard his name echoing beneath the vaults. Albert was calling him. He waited until the two men had got well away before replying, not wishing to let them know that there had been a witness who, even though he had not seen their faces, had not missed a word of their conversation. Ten minutes later, France was driving back towards the Hôtel d'Espagne, listening with quite unmannerly lack of attention to the learned discourse that Albert was making, based on Pliny and Calpurnius, about the nets furnished with iron spikes which used to prevent the wild animals from pouncing on the spectators. He let him chatter on without arguing. He was anxious to be left alone so that he could give his whole mind to what had just taken place in front of him. One of the two men had certainly been a stranger to him, and this had been the first time that he had seen or heard him, but the same was not true of the other. And, though France had not been able to make out the man's face, which was constantly wrapped either in darkness or in his cloak, the sound of that voice had struck him too forcibly the first time he heard it for him to ever hear it again without recognising it. There was, after all, something strident and metallic in those mocking tones which had made him tremble in the ruins of the Colosseum as before in the caves of Monte Cristo. He was utterly convinced that the man was none other than Sinbad the sailor. The curiosity that the man had inspired in him was so great that in any other circumstances he would have made himself known to him, but on this occasion the conversation he had just heard was too personal for him not to be constrained by the very reasonable fear that his appearance would not be welcome. So he had let him depart, as we saw, though promising himself that, if they met again, he would not let another opportunity escape as he had this one. Franz was too preoccupied to sleep well. He spent the night going over and over in his mind everything he knew about the man in the caves and the stranger in the Colosseum, and which would support the idea that they were one and the same. And the more he thought about it, the more convinced he was. He did not fall asleep until daybreak, which meant that he woke up very late. Albert, like a true Parisian, had already made his plans for the evening. He had sent someone to book a box at the Teatro Argentina. As France had several letters to write home, he abandoned the carriage to Albert for the whole day. At five o'clock, Albert returned. He had taken round his letters of introduction, had received invitations for every evening of his stay, and had seen Rome. A day had been enough for him to do all this, and he still had time to find out what opera was being performed, and with which actors. The piece was called Parisina, and the actors were named Corselli, Mariani, and La Speche. As you can see, our two young men were not especially hard done by. They were going to attend a performance of one of the best operas, by the author of Lucia de Lamamor, performed by three of the most renowned artists in Italy. Albert had never been able to get used to these Italian theatres, to the orchestra pit where you could not walk around and to the absence of balconies or open boxes. All this was hard for a man who had his own stall in the opera buffet and a share in the omnibus box at the opera. But it did not prevent Albert from dressing up outrageously every time he went to the opera with France, a wasted effort, for it must be admitted to the shame of one of the most deserving representatives of French fashion, in the four months during which he had travelled the length and breadth of Italy, Albert had not had a single romantic adventure. He sometimes tried to joke about this, but underneath he was deeply mortified. 
He, Albert de Morcerf, one of the most eligible of young men, was still idly kicking his heels. It was all the more painful since, with the usual modesty of our dear compatriots, Albert had left Paris convinced that he would score the most astonishing triumphs in Italy, and, on his return, delight the whole Boulevard de Gaulle with the story of his successes. Alas, it had not been so. The charming Genovese, Florentine and Neapolitan countesses had chosen to stick not with their husbands but with their lovers, and Albert had come to the painful conclusion that Italian women at least have this over their French sisters, that they are faithful in their infidelity. By which I do not mean that in Italy, as everywhere, there may not be exceptions. Yet Albert was not only a most elegant young bachelor, but also a man of considerable wit. Moreover, he was a Viscount, of the new nobility, admittedly, but nowadays, when one no longer has to prove one's title, what does it matter if it dates from 1399 or from 1815? Added to all this, he had an income of 50,000 livres. That is more than one needs, as we can see, to be fashionable in Paris. So, all in all, it was slightly humiliating not to have been seriously noticed by anyone in the towns through which they had passed. However, he fully intended to make up for lost time in Rome, carnival being, in every country on earth where that admirable institution is celebrated, a time of liberty when even the sternest may be led into some act of folly. So, since the carnival was due to start the following day, it was most important for Albert to present his credentials before it began. With this in mind, he had rented one of the most prominent boxes in the theatre and was impeccably fitted out for the occasion. They were on the first level, corresponding to our balcony. In any event, in Italy the first three floors are all as aristocratic as each other, which is why they are known as the noble parts of the auditorium. And the box, which could comfortably hold a dozen spectators, had cost the two friends a little more than the box for four people at the Ambigu. Albert had an additional hope, which was that if he managed to find a place in the heart of some beautiful Roman woman, this would automatically lead to the award of a posto in her carriage, and consequently he would see the carnival from the top of some aristocratic vehicle, or from a princely balcony. All of these considerations made Albert more lively than ever before. He turned his back on the actors, leant half out of the box, and eyed all the pretty women through a pair of opera glasses six inches long. All of this did not induce one single woman to reward all Albert's agitation with a solitary glance, even of curiosity. Instead, the audience was thoroughly absorbed with its own affairs, loves, pleasures, or talking about the carnival which was to begin on the day after the end of Holy Week, without paying a moment's attention either to the actors or to the play, except at certain specific points when everyone would turn back towards the stage, either to listen to a section of Caselli's recitative, or to applaud some virtuoso effect by Moriani, or else to cry bravo to La Speche, after which the private conversations would be resumed as before. Towards the end of the first act, Franz looked across to a box that had until then remained empty, and saw the door open to admit a young woman to whom he had had the honour of being introduced in Paris, but whom he assumed was still in France. Albert noticed his friend start at seeing this person, and turned to ask him, "'Do you know that woman?' "'Yes,' Franz replied. "'What do you think of her?' "'Charming, my dear fellow, and blonde. Oh, what delightful hair! Is she French? Venetian. And her name? Countess... G oh, I know the name! Albert exclaimed. Her wit is said to be equal to her beauty. Good heavens, just think! I could have been introduced to her at Madame de Vifor Vifor's last ball, which she attended, but I neglected to do so. What an idiot I am! Would you like me to make up for the omission? Why, do you know her well enough to take me to her box? I have had the honour to speak to her three or four times in my life, but, you know, that's quite enough for us not to be committing any faux pas. 
At this moment, the Countess noticed Franz, and gave him a graceful, wa graceful wave with her hand, to which he replied by bowing respectfully. "'Well, I never! But it looks to me as if you could be on very close terms with her,' said Albert. "'That's just where you're wrong, and the very thing that is constantly leading us Frenchmen into one blunder or other when we are abroad. We judge everything from a Parisian point of view. In Spain, above all in Italy, you can never tell how intimate people are by the informality of their behaviour together. The Countess and I happened to find common ground, nothing more. "'In the heart?' Albert asked, laughing. "'No, simply in the mind.' Franz replied seriously. On what occasion? On the occasion of a walk in the Colosseum, very much like the one we took together. By moonlight? Yes. Alone? Almost. And you spoke of the dead? Ha! Huh! Albert exclaimed. That is highly diverting. Well, I promise you that if I should ever have the good fortune to accompany the beautiful Countess on such a walk, I should only talk to her about the living. You might perhaps be wrong. But until that happens, would you introduce me to her as you promised? As soon as the curtain falls. How devilish long this first act is! Listen to the finale. It's splendid, and Coselli sings it exceptionally well. Yes, but look how he carries himself. No one could act better than La Speche. You know, when you've seen La Sontagne and La Mal Malibran, don't you find Moriani's technique excellent? I don't like brunettes who sing blonde. <laughs> My dear chap, said Franz, turning around while Albert continued to peer through his opera glasses, you really are too fussy. At last the curtain fell, much to the satisfaction of the Vicomte de Montcerf, who took his hat, rapidly adjusted his hair, his cravat and his cuffs, and told Franz that he was waiting. Franz had exchanged a look with the Countess, who indicated that he would be welcome, so he wasted no time in satisfying his friend's eagerness and set off round the semicircle, followed by Albert, who took advantage of this journey to smooth out some creases that might have appeared in his shirt collar and the lapels of his coat, so that, so that they eventually arrived at box number four, which was the one occupied by the Countess. Immediately, the young man sitting beside her at the front of the box got up, according to the custom in Italy, and gave his seat to the newcomer, who must relinquish it in his turn when a new visitor arrives. Franz introduced Albert to the Countess as one of our most distinguished young people, both for his social standing and for his wit. All of which was true, for, in Paris, and in the society in which Albert moved, he was a model of a young gentleman. Franz added that, desperate at not having been able to take advantage of the Countess's stay in Paris to obtain an introduction to her, he had asked him to repair this omission, and he was doing precisely that while begging the Countess to forgive his presumption, since he himself might have been thought to need someone formally to introduce him to the Countess. She replied by greeting Albert in the most charming way and offering Franz her hand. At her invitation, Albert took the empty seat at the front, while Franz sat in the second row behind them. Albert had found an excellent subject of conversation, Paris. He'd talk, he talked to the Countess of their mutual acquaintances. Franz realised that things were going well, and decided to, to let them... Excuse me. And decided to let them continue in that way. Asking for the loan of Albert's gigantic opera glasses, he began to study the audience for himself. Sitting alone at the front of a box, at the third level facing them, was a superbly beautiful woman, dressed in Greek costume, which she wore with such ease that it was clear that this style of dress was natural to her. Excuse me. Behind her, in the shadows, could be seen the outline of a man, though it was impossible to make out his face. Franz interrupted the conversation between Albert and the Countess to ask the latter if she knew the lovely Albanian woman who so much deserved to attract the attention not only of men, but also of women. 
No, she answered. All I do know is that she has been in Rome throughout the season, because when the theatre opened at its start, I saw her where you see her now, and in the past month she has not missed a single performance. Sometimes in company with the man who is with her at present, sometimes simply attended by a servant. What do you think of her, Countess? Extremely beautiful. Medora must have looked like her. Franz and the Countess exchanged a smile. She went back to her conversation with Albert, and Franz to examining the Albanian. The curtain rose for the ballet. It was one of those fine Italian ballets directed by the celebrated Henri, who had acquired an enormous reputation as a choreographer in Italy before losing it in the nautical theatre. One of those ballets where everyone, from the principals to the chorus line, is so actively involved that 150 dancers make the same movement at the same time, lifting the same arm or leg in perfect unison. This ballet was called Poliska. France was too preoccupied with his beautiful Greek woman to take any notice of the ballet, interesting though it was. As for her, she was clearly enjoying the performance, and her pleasure was in the most marked contrast to the profound indifference of the man who accompanied her. Throughout the entire length of this choreographic masterpiece, he remained utterly motionless, and, despite the infernal racket emanating from the trumpets, bells and cymbals, appeared to be enjoying the celestial delights of a luxurious and untroubled sleep. At last the ballet ended, and the curtain fell, amid frenzied applause from the delighted audience in the stalls. Because of this custom of dividing up the opera with a ballet, intervals are very short in Italian theatres, as the singers have an opportunity to rest and change their costumes while the dancers are executing their pirouettes and concocting their entrechats. So the overture of the second act began, and at the first touch of the strings, Franz saw the sleeper slowly rise up and come over to the Greek woman, who turned around to speak to him, then returned to her position, leaning against the front of the box. The man's face was still in shadow, and Franz could see none of his features. The curtain rose, and Franz's attention was inevitably drawn to the actors, so for a moment his eyes left the box with the beautiful Greek woman, and turned to the stage. As we know, the act opens with the dream duet. In her sleep, Parisina lets slip the secret of her love for Ugo in front of Azzo. The betrayed husband goes through all the rages of jealousy until, convinced that his wife is being unfaithful to him, he wakes, up, wakes her up to announce his forthcoming revenge. This duo is one of the most lovely, most expressive and most powerful to have come from Donizetti's fertile pen. This was the third time that Franz had heard it, and though he had no pretensions to being pre yeah, no, had, had no pretensions to being a fanatical opera lover, it had a profound effect on him. So he was about to join in with the applause coming from the rest of the theatre when his hands, on the point of meeting, remained frozen opposite one another, and the bravo that was on the point of emerging from his lips died before reaching them. The man in the box had stood up entirely, and, now that his head was in the light, Franz had just once more recognised the mysterious inhabitant of Monte Cristo, the very same whose figure and voice he had so clearly recognised the evening before in the ruins of the Colosseum. There could no longer be any doubt. The strange traveller lived in Rome. The expression on Franz's face must have reflected the turmoil that this apparition created in his mind, because the Countess looked at him, burst out laughing and asked what was wrong. Madame la Comtesse, Franz replied, a moment ago I asked you if you knew that Albanian woman. Now I am wondering if you know her husband? No more than I do her. You've never noticed him before? <laughs> There's a very French question. You must know that for an Italian woman there is no man in the world except the one that she loves. Of course, said Franz. In any case, she remarked, putting Albert's opera glasses to her eyes and turning them towards the box, someone must have recently dug him out. 
He looks like a corpse, which has just emerged from the tomb with the gravedigger's permission, because he is atrociously pale. He's always like that, said Franz. Do you know him, then? asked the Countess. In that case, I should be asking you who he is. I believe I have seen him before. I think I recognise him. I can certainly understand, she said with a movement of her lovely shoulders, as, as if she had felt a chill in her veins, that when one had seen such a man once, one would never forget him. So the feeling that Franz had experienced was not peculiar to him, since someone else also felt it. Well then, Franz asked the Countess, who had decided to take another look at him, what do you think of that man? He looks to me like Lord Ruthwen in flesh and blood. Franz was struck by this new association with Byron. If any man could make one believe in vampires, this was he. I must find out who he is, Franz said, getting up. No, no, cried the Countess, don't leave me. I must keep you to myself, because I'm counting on you to take me home. What? Are you serious? Franz asked, leaning over to whisper in her ear. Are you really afraid? Listen, she said. Lord Byron swore to me that he believed in vampires. He even told me that he had seen them, and described how they look. And that was it exactly. The black hair, the large eyes glowing with some strange light, that deathly pallor. Then, observe that he is not with a woman like other women, but with a foreigner, a Greek, and no doubt a magician like himself. I beg you, stay with me. Go and look for him tomorrow if you must, but t today I declare that I am keeping you here. Franz insisted. Listen, she said, getting up. I am going. I cannot stay until the end of the opera because I have guests at home. Will you be so unmannerly as to refuse me your company? There was no reply to this except to take his hat, open the door, and offer the Countess his arm, which he accordingly did. The Countess was genuinely quite deeply troubled and Franz himself could not avoid feeling some superstitious terror, all the more natural in that what, with the Countess, was the outcome of instinct, with him derived from memory. He felt her tremble as she got into her carriage. He drove her back home. There were no guests there, and no one was expecting her. He reproved her. In truth, she said, I am not feeling well, and I need to be alone. The sight of that man has quite upset me. Franz tried to laugh. Don't laugh, she said. I know that you don't really want to, but do promise me one thing. What? Promise? Anything you wish, except to give up my search to discover who that man is. I have reasons, which I cannot tell you, for discovering the answer and where he comes from and where he is going. I don't know where he comes from, but I can tell you where he is going. To hell, for certain. So what is the promise that you want to demand of me, Countess? It is to go directly back to your hotel and not try to see that man this evening. There are certain affinities between the people that one meets and those one has just left, don't serve as a conductor between that man and me. Go after him tomorrow if you wish, but never introduce him to me, unless you want me to die of fright. And now, good night. Try to sleep. I, for my part, know one person who will not. With these words, she took her farewell of France, leaving him uncertain whether she had been enjoying a joke at his expense, or if she really had felt as afraid as she claimed. On returning to the hotel, he found Albert wearing his dressing gown and pantaloons, contentedly lounging in an armchair and smoking a cigar. "'Oh, it's you!' he said. "'I swear I didn't expect to see you until tomorrow.' "'My dear Albert,' Franz replied, "'I am pleased to have this opportunity to tell you once and for all that you have the most erroneous notions about Italian women.' though I should have thought that your disappointments in love would made you relinquish them by now. 
What do you expect? It's impossible to understand the confounded creatures. They give you their hand, they press yours, they whisper to you, they allow you to accompany them home. With only a quarter of all this, a Parisian's woman's reputation would be in tatters. Precisely. It's because they have nothing to hide, and because they live their lives under the midday sun that women are so easy-going in the lovely land that rings to the sound of sea, as Dante put it. In any case, you could see that the Countess was really afraid. Afraid of what? Of that respectable gentleman sitting opposite us with the pretty Greek woman? I wanted to put my mind at rest when they left, so I crossed them in the corridor. He's a handsome young man, it turned... Uh, well, he's a handsome young man, well turned out, who looks as if he dresses in France at Blinz or Humans. A little pale, admittedly, but of course pallor is the mark of distinction. Franz smiled. Albert had pretensions to looking pale. I am convinced, Franz said, that there is no sense in the Countess's ideas about him. Did he say anything in your hearing? He did speak, but in Ramaic. I recognise the language from some corrupted words of Greek. I must tell you, my dear fellow, that I was very good at Greek when I was at school. So he spoke Ramaic? Probably. There's no doubt. It's him. What? Uh, nothing. So what were you doing here? Preparing a surprise for you. What surprise? You know it's impossible to get a carriage. Good Lord, we've done everything humanly possible, but in vain. Well, I've had a wonderful idea. Franz gave Albert the look of someone who did not have much confidence in his ideas. My good fellow, said Albert, you have just favoured me with a look which will oblige me to demand satisfaction. I am ready to give it to you, my dear friend, if your, if your idea is as ingenious as you claim. Listen, I am listening. There is no means of obtaining a carriage, is there? None. Or horses? Or horses. But we could get a cart. Perhaps. And a pair of oxen? Pro probably. Well then, that's what we need. I will have the cart decorated, we can dress up as Neapolitan farm workers, and we will be a living representation of the splendid painting by Leopold Robert. If for the sake of our st of, if for the sake of still greater authenticity, the Countess wishes to put on a costume of a woman of Puzzoli or Sorrento, this will complete the tableau, and she is beautiful enough to represent the original of the woman with child. Why? Franz exclaimed. This time you're right, Monsieur Albert. This is a really inspired idea. And altogether French. Coming direct for the, from the do-nothing kings, precisely that. Ah, you Romans, did you think we would run around your streets on foot like Lazzaroni, just because you have a shortage of horses and carriages? Not a bit of it. We'll think something up. Have you told anyone of this brilliant scheme yet? Our host. When I got back, I called him up and told him what we would need. He assured me that nothing could be simpler. I wanted to have gold leaf put on the horns of the oxen, but he said it would take three days, so we'll have to do without that detail. Where is he? Who? Our host. L looking for the cart. Tomorrow may be too late. So you're expecting his reply this evening? At any moment. On this, the door opened and Signor Pastrini put his head round. Permesso? He said. Most certainly, certainly it's permitted, said Franz. Tell me then, said Albert, have you found us the oxen we asked for and the cart that we need? I have found better than that, came the self-satisfied reply. Beware, my dear Signor Pastrini, said Albert, the better is the enemy of the good. Let your excellencies trust in me, said Signor Pastrini, speaking with the voice of competence. So what do you have? asked Franz. You know that the Count of Monte Cristo is staying on the same floor as you. Most certainly we do know it, said Albert. It's thanks to him that we are housed like two students in the rude Saint Nicolas de Chardonnay. Very well. 
but he knows of your difficulty and has required me to offer you two places in his carriage and two places places at his windows in the Palazzo Rospoli. Albert and Franz looked at one another. Albert said, Should we accept this offer from a stranger, someone we don't know? What kind of a man is this Count of Monte Cristo? Franz asked the innkeeper. A, a very important Sicilian or Maltese gentleman. I am not quite sure... Excuse me. I am not quite sure which, but as aristocratic as a Borghese and as rich as a gold mine. It strikes me, Franz said, that if this man was as well-mannered as our host says, he would have found some other way to deliver his invitation, in writing or... At that moment there was a knock on the door. Come in, said Franz. A servant, dressed in perfectly elegant livery, appeared at the door of the room. From the Count of Monte Cristo to Monsieur Franz d'Epinay and Monsieur le Vicomte Albert de Morcerf, he said, and handed two cards to the innkeeper, which the latter passed on to the two men. As their neighbour, Monsieur le Comte de Monte Cristo, the servant continued, asks permission of these gentlemen to visit them tomorrow morning. He begs the gentlemen to be so good as to tell him at what hour they will be able to receive him. The deuce! Albert exclaimed to Franz. There's nothing more to be said. Please inform the Count, Franz replied, that it is we who shall have the honour to visit him. The servant went out. This is what you might call overwhelming us with courtesies, said Albert. You are quite clearly right, Signor Pastrini. This Count of Monte Cristo of yours is a perfect gentleman. So you will accept his offer? Good heavens, yes said Albert, though I must admit that I rather regret our peasants on the cart. And if there was not the window in the Palazzo Rospoli to make up for what we, what we shall be losing, I should keep to my original idea. What do you say, Franz? I too say that the windows in the Palazzo Rospoli have made up my mind for me, he said. This offer of two places at a window in the Palazzo Rospoli had reminded Franz of the conversation which he had heard in the ruins of the Colosseum between the stranger and the man from Trastavere, in the course of which the man with the cloak had promised to win a pardon for the condemned prisoner. If, as everything led Franz to believe, the man in the cloak was the same whose appearance in the Sala Argentina had so greatly preoccupied him, he would no doubt recognise the man, and nothing would then prevent him from satisfying his curiosity. He spent part of the night dreaming about his two apparitions and looking forward to the next day. Then everything should become clear. This time, unless his host possessed the ring of Guy and the power that it confers of making oneself invisible, it was clear that he would not escape. In consequence, he was awake before eight o'clock. As for Albert, who had not the same reasons as Franz to wake up early, he was still fast asleep. Franz called for the innkeeper, who arrived, behaving with his accustomed, accustomed obsequiousness. Signor Pastrini, he asked, is there not to be an execution today? Yes, Excellency, but if you are asking me to have a window, it is a bit late to start thinking about it. No, no, in any case, if I was really anxious to see this spectacle, I suppose I could find a place on the Monte Pincio? Oh, I, I assumed that Your Excellency would not wish to mingle with the common herd, which finds that a kind of natural amphitheatre. I shall probably not go, said Franz, but I should like to have a few details. What? I should like to know how many condemned men there are, their names and the nature of the penalty they are to suffer. Oh, perfectly timed, Excellency. I have just been brought the tavolette. Uh, what are the tavolette? Tavolette are the wooden tablets which are hung at every street corner on the day of an execution, with a notice stuck to them giving the names of the condemned, the charge, and the method of execution. These notices are intended to invite the faithful to pray that God will make the guilty men truly repentant. And these tavolette are brought to you so that you can add your prayers to those of the faithful? Franz asked dubiously. 
no, Excellency, I have an understanding with the bill poster, and he brings these to me as, as he does the advertisements for entertainments, so that if any of my guests wish to watch the execution, they can be fully informed. Huh, how very thoughtful, Franz exclaimed. Yes, said Signor Pastrini with a smile. I flatter myself that I do all in my power to satisfy the noble foreigners who honour me with their confidence. As I see, Signor Pastrini, I shall mention the fact to whoever wishes to hear it, of that you may be sure. Meanwhile, uh, perhaps I could read one of these tavolettes? Oh, with no trouble at all, said the innkeeper, opening the door. I have had one put on the landing. He went out, took down the tavoletta, and handed it to France. Here is a literal translation of the notice. Let all be informed that on, that on Tuesday, the 22nd of February, the first day of Carnival, by order of the court of La Rota, the sentence of death will be carried out in the Piazza del Popolo on Andrea Rondolo, guilty of murder against the most respectable and venerated person of Don Cesare Terlini, canon of the Church of St. John Lateran, and on Peppino, alias Rocco P Rocca Piori, found guilty of complicity with the abominable bandit Luigi Vampa and his followers. The first will be Masolato, the second Decapitato. All charitable souls are requested to pray God for the sin sincere repentance of these two miserable creatures. This was precisely what Franz had to heard two days earlier in the ruins of the Colosseum, and nothing had changed. The names of the condemned men, the crimes for which, were the, for which they were to suffer, and the methods of execution were exactly the same. This meant that, in all probability, the Trastevern was none other than the bandit Luigi Vampa, and the man in the cloak Sinbad the Sailor, who, in Rome, as in Porto Vecchio and in Tunis, was engaged in yet another philanthropic mission. However, time was passing and it was nine o'clock. Franz was on his way to wake Albert up, when, to his great astonishment, he saw him emerging from his room, fully dressed. The idea of carnival had passed through his head and woken him earlier than his friend could have hoped. Very well, Franz said to the innkeeper. Now we are both ready, do you think, dear Monsieur Pastrini, that we might introduce ourselves to the Count of Monte Cristo? Oh, yes, indeed. The Count of Monte Cristo is in the habit of rising very early, and I'm sure that he must have been up for two hours. And you don't think it would be at all indiscreet to go and see him at this hour? Not at all. In that case, Albert, if you're ready. Quite ready. Let us go and thank our neighbour for his courtesy. Let's go. France and Albert had only to cross the landing. The innkeeper preceded them and rang on their behalf. A servant opened. I signori Franceschi, said the innkeeper. The servant bowed and ushered them in. They crossed two rooms, furnished with a degree of luxury that they had not expected to find in Signor Pastrini's establishment, and finally arrived in a supremely elegant drawing room. A Turkish carpet covered the floor, and there were the most comfortable seats with ample cushions and tilted backs. Fine old master paintings hung from the walls, with splendid displays of weapons arranged between them, and tapestry hangings covered the doors. If their excellencies would like to sit down, said the servant, I shall inform Monsieur le Comte. He went out of one of the doors. For a moment, when the door opened, the two friends had caught the sound of a guzla, but it was immediately extinguished. Extinguished. The door, almost no sooner opened than closed, had, as it were, allowed this brief gust of music to waft into the drawing room. France and Albert looked at one another, and then round the furniture, the, piece, the pictures and the armaments. At second glance it all looked even more impressive to them than at first. "'Well?' Franz asked his friend. "'What do you make of this?' "'My dear fellow, what I make of it is that either our neighbour is some stockbroker who gambled successfully on Spanish stock, or else he is a prince who is travelling incognito.' "'Hush!' Franz said. We'll soon know. Here he comes. 
The sound of a door opening on its hinges had just reached the two visitors, and almost at once the tapestry parted to make way for the owner of all this wealth. Albert stepped forward, but Franz remained rooted to the spot. The man who had just entered was none other than the cloaked figure in the Colosseum, the stranger in the box at the theatre, and his mysterious host on the island of Monte Cristo. Dun, dun, dun! Nobody knew this. Oh my god, so surprising. Uh, that is where we shall, uh, we shall take a break, I think. Also, Sing Blonde. Yeah, I didn't understand. That's The Undertaker's Meat. What? No, it's not. Shut up. Um, did I miss subs and things? Sil! Thank you for subscribing again. Uh, and also, hello. I hope you are well. Uh, but yes, uh, I think we shall take a break there. I hope everybody is doing well and yeah, go go do break things and we shall see you back in about five minutes. Bye for now.
And welcome back from the break. Uh, apologies if the break was slightly longer. I, I was trying to find various mugs for tea purposes. I hope everybody has had a good break, um, has replenished uh, slash emptied liquids that need to be either replenished or emptied. And I hope you are all comfortable and chilled and enjoying the story so far. Um, the chapters are, are indeed getting longer, um, although the next one I think is, is slightly shorter. Um, but I think I'll yeah I'll just I'll just read one more chapter and then call it there for the night. Um, but we're 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 getting through it. We're probably about a third of the way through now. Ready for Ezio to get his good yeah his next mission. Yeah, there's it's, there's there's a lot of Italian in it, and it's very much. Stop this guy from getting murdered or or jump down from a building and stab someone kind of thing. Such a nice story. It is surprisingly good. Um, I was expecting it to be more filler. I think, as I've said lots of times, just I was expecting it to be for, for the fact that it's just an absolute tome. It's huge. I was expecting it to be more. And then this person went on this long voyage, which I will tell you every detail of, even though you don't need to know. Um, but it's not. It's very sort of action-packed for the whole thing. Um, which is, yeah, it's, it's quite a saga. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm, I'm glad you are back. Trill trilogies. Wow, that's a way of spelling it. like trilbies but um, but yeah I'm glad you're enjoying it so it's the Hobbit is not all there is it's just making it yeah right, right, right. um yeah exactly um but also I hope I hope you're doing you're doing well so uh, uh but uh, but yeah I'm I'm still still enjoying it. it it is it is a good book um also apologies if there was quite a lot of buffering um, before the break. Things seem to have sort of stabilised now, but my internet's been a bit bleh tonight, so um, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, hopefully that won't pass on into the VOD. Um, so anyone who yeah watches the VOD shouldn't have to deal with with the uh, internet's gone into not. Yes. Precisely. Into why? Um... But yes, we shall continue with the Count of Monte Cristo and see what happens next. Oh, more Italian. Yeah. I'll take a sip of my tea. One sec. That's very hot tea. I won't do that. Ciao. Yes. Good job. Love it. Stop. Please. <sighs> okay. Chapter 35. La Mazzolata. Gentlemen, said the Count of Monte Cristo as he came in, I, I apologize for allowing you to anticipate my call, but I was afraid that it might have been indiscreet of me to visit you any earlier than this. In any case, you informed me that you would come, so I have kept myself at your disposal. 
Franz and I must thank you a thousand times, Count, said Albert. We you have truly spared us a great deal of irritation. We were inventing the most fantastic sorts of conveyance when we received your most kind invitation. Upon my soul, gentlemen, the Count said, motioning the two young men to sit down on a divan. It is only because of that idiot Pastrini that I did not come to your rescue earlier. He told me nothing of your difficulty, even though he must have known that I, alone as I am here, wanted nothing better than to make the acquaintance of my neighbours. As soon as I knew that I could be of service to you, you can see how eagerly I grasped the opportunity to present my compliments. The two young men bowed. France had not yet said a word. He had not been able to make up his mind, and, since nothing indicated that the Count either wished to recognise him or to be recognised by him, he did not know whether he should make any allusion to the past, or leave time in the future for something new to arise. Moreover, while he was sure that it was the Count who had been in the theatre on the previous evening, he could not be so sure that it was also the same person who had been in the Colosseum on the evening before so he decided to let events take their course without himself making any direct reference to what had occurred. In addition, this gave him an advantage over the Count, being the master of his secret, while he could have no hold over France, who had nothing to hide. However, he decided to lead the conversation towards a point which might, meanwhile, confirm a few of his suspicions. Monsieur le Comte, he said, you have offered us places in your carriage and your, at your windows in the Palazzo Rospoli. Now can you tell us how we might obtain some posto, as they say here in Italy, overlooking the Piazza del Popolo? Yes, you are quite right, the Count said in an off-hand manner, not taking his eyes off Morself. Is there not something like an execution in the Piazza del Popolo? There is. France said, seeing that the conversation was turning of, of itself towards the point where he wished to bring it. "'Please wait one moment. I believe that I told my steward yesterday to take care of that. Perhaps I can do you this further small service.' He reached out for the bell pull, which he rang three times. "'Have you ever paused to consider?' he asked France, "'how to save time and simplify the comings and goings of servants?' I have studied the matter. When I ring once, it's for my valet, twice for my butler, and three times for my steward. In this way I do not waste time or words. Ah, here he is now. A man of between forty-five and fifty years of age came in. To France he was the spitting image of the smuggler who had shown him into the cave. But he gave not the slightest sign of recognition. He understood that the man was under orders. Monsieur Petruccio, the Count said, I asked you yesterday to obtain a window for me overlooking the Piazza del Popolo. Did you take care of it? Yes, Excellency, the steward answered, but we left it very late. What? the Count said, raising an eyebrow. Didn't I tell you that I wished to have one? And your Excellency does have one, the same that was rented to Prince Lubaniev, but I was obliged to pay a hundred... Very good, very good, Monsieur Bertuccio. You may spare these gentlemen all the housekeeping details. You managed to obtain the window, which is all that matters. Give the address of the house to the coachman, and be ready on the stairs to conduct us there. That's all. You may go. The steward bowed and took a step towards the door. Uh, one moment, the Count said. Be so good as to ask Pastrini as, uh, if he has received the tavoletta, and if he could send me the programme of the execution. Oh, no need, said Franz, taking his notebook out of his pocket. I have seen the tablet myself and copied it down. Here it is. Splendid. In that case, Bertuccio, you may go. I shan't need you any more. Just get them to tell us when luncheon is served. "'Will these gentlemen,' he asked, turning to the two friends, "'do me the honour of taking lunch with me?' "'But, Monsieur le Comte,' said Albert, "'that would really be imposing on you.' "'Not at all. On the contrary, you would oblige me greatly, "'and one or other, or perhaps both of you, "'can return the favour one day in Paris. "'Monsieur Bertuccio, ask them to lay three places.' "'He took the notebook from France's hand.' 
So we were saying, he continued in the same tone of voice as though he were reading the personal column, that on Tuesday the 22nd of February, the first day of carnival, by order of the, count, uh, by order of the court of La Rota, the sentence of death will be carried out in the Piazza del Popolo on Andrea Rondolo, guilty of murder against the most respectable and venerated person of Don Cesare Terlini, canon of the Church of Saint, uh, Saint John Lateran, and Peppino, alias Rocca Paiori, found guilty of complicity with the abominable bandit Luigi Vampa and his followers. Hmm. The first will be Mazzolato, the second decapitato. Yes, this is what was originally intended, but I think that since yesterday there has been a change in the order and conduct of the ceremony. Ha! Huh, said Franz. Yes, I spent the evening yesterday with Cardinal Rospigliosi, and they were speaking of some kind of stay of execution having been granted to one of the two condemned men. To Andrea Rondolo? asked Franz. No, the Count replied casually. To the other, he looked at the notebook as if to remind himself of the name, to Peppino alias Rocca Priori. That means you will be denied a guillotining, but you still have the mazzolata, which is a very curious form of torture when you see it for the first time, or even the second, uh, while the other, which in any case you must know, is too simple, too unvaried. There is nothing unexpected in it. The mandaya makes no mistakes. Its hand doesn't shake, it doesn't miss, and it doesn't make thirty attempts before succeeding, like the soldier who beheaded the Comte de Chalet, and who perhaps had been particularly chosen for this victim by Richelieu. <laughs> Come now, said the Count in a scornful tone. Don't talk to me about Europeans when torture is concerned. They understand nothing about it. With them, cruelty is in its infancy, or perhaps its old age. Truly, Monsieur le Comte, said France, anyone would think you had made a comparative study of executions in different parts of the world. There are very few types, at least, that I have not seen, the Count replied coldly. Did it please you to witness these horrible spectacles? My first feeling was repulsion, my second indifference, and my third curiosity. Curiosity? The idea is terrible, isn't it? Why? There is only one serious matter to be considered in life, and that is death. So isn't it worth one's curiosity to study the different ways that the soul may leave the body, and how, according to the character, the temperament, or even the local customs of a country, individuals face up to that supreme journey from being to nothingness? As for me, I can assure you of one thing. The more you have seen others die, the easier it becomes to die oneself. So, in my opinion, death may be a torment, but it is not an expiation. I am not sure that I understand, said Franz. Please explain. I, I can't tell you how interested I am in what you say. Listen said the Count, his face flushing with the gall of hatred as another face might be coloured with blood. If a man had murdered your father, your mother, your mistress, or any of those beings who, when they are torn from your heart, leave an eternal void and a wound that can never be staunched, and if he had subjected them to unspeakable torture and endless torment, would you consider that society had accorded you sufficient reparation just because the blade of the guillotine had travelled between the base of the murderer's occipital and his trapezius muscles, and because the person who had caused you to feel years of moral suffering had experienced a few seconds of physical pain? I know, Franz said, human justice is inadequate as a consolation. It can spill blood for blood, that's all. One must only ask it for what is possible, not for anything more. Moreover, the example that I give you is a material one, the Count went on, one where society, attacked by the death of an individual among the mass of individuals which composes it, avenges that death by another. 
but are there not millions of sufferings which can rend the entrails of a man without society taking the slightest heed of them, or providing even the inadequate means of reparation that we spoke of just now? Are there not crimes for which impalement a la Turk, or Persian burial alive, or the whips of the Iraqis would be too mild a torment, but which, but which society in its indifference leaves unpunished? Answer me, are there no such crimes? Yes, Franz replied. It is precisely to punish them that we tolerate duelling. Ah, duelling, exclaimed the Count. There's a fine way, I must say, to achieve one's end, when the end is vengeance. A man has stolen your mistress, a man has seduced your wife, a man has dishonoured your daughter. He has taken an entire life a life that had the right to expect from God the share of happiness that he promises to every human being in creating us, and turned it into a mere existence of pain, misery, and infamy, and you consider yourself revenged because you have run this man through with your sword, or put a bullet in its head, in his head, after he has turned your mind to delirium and your heart to despair? Come, come, even without considering that he is often the one who comes out of this contest on top, purged in the eyes of the world and in some respect pardoned by God. No, no, the Count went on. Went on. If I ever had to take my revenge, that is not how I should do it. You mean you disapprove of duelling? You mean you wouldn't fight a duel? Albert asked, joining the conversation, and astonished at hearing anyone express such an odd point of view. "'Oh, certainly,' said the Count. "'Make no mistake. I should fight a duel for a trifle, an insult, a contradiction, a slap, and all the more merrily for knowing that, thanks to the skill I have acquired in all physical exercises and long experience of danger, I should be more or less certain of killing my opponent.' Oh, yes, indeed, I should fight a duel for any of these things. But in return for a slow, deep, infinite, eternal pain, I should return as nearly as possible a pain equivalent to the one inflicted on me. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, as they say in the East, those men who are the elect of creation. Elect of creation, and who have learnt to make a life of dreams and a paradise of reality. With such an outlook, Franz told the Count, which makes you judge and executioner in your own case, it would be hard for you to confine yourself to actions that would leave you forever immune to the power of the law. Hatred is blind and anger deaf. The one who pours himself a cup of vengeance is likely to drink a bitter draught. Yes, if he is poor and clumsy. No, if he is a millionaire and adroit. In any case, if the worst comes to the worst, he can only suffer the ultimate penalty which we mentioned just now, the one that the philanthropic French Revolution put in place of quartering in the wheel. Well then, what does the penalty matter if he is avenged? In truth, I am almost irritated at the fact that, quite probably, this miserable Peppino will not be decapitato, as they say. You'd see how long it takes, and whether it's really worth bothering about. But, gentlemen, this is indeed an odd topic of discussion for carnival time. How did we get round to it? Ah, yes, I remember. You asked for a seat at my window. Well, very well, then, yes, you shall have one. But first, let's eat. I see that they have come to tell us we are served. A servant had opened one of the four doors of the drawing room, and at this pronounced the sacramental words, Al suo comando. The two young men got up and went through to the dining room. During lunch, which was excellent and served with the greatest refinement, Franz tried to read in Albert's eyes the impression that he was sure their host's words would have left on him. But whether it was that, with his habitual insouciance, he had not paid great attention to them, or that the Count of Monte Cristo's concession on the matter of duelling had reconciled him to the man, or finally that prior events which we have related, and which were known only to France, had doubled the effect that the Count's theories had on him, he did not perceive that his friend was in the slightest bit concerned. On the contrary, 
He was paying the meal the compliment one would expect from a man who has been condemned for four or five months to suffer Italian cooking, which is among the worst in the world. As for the Count, he barely touched each dish. One would think that courtesy alone had induced him to sit down with his guests and that he was waiting for them to leave, to have himself brought some rare or special delicacy. Franz was involuntarily reminded of the terror that the Count had, inspi <coughs> Excuse me. had inspired in the Contessa, and her unshakable conviction that the man whom he had shown her in the opposite box at the theatre was a vampire. When lunch was finished, Franz took out his watch. "'What are you doing?' the Count asked. "'You must excuse us, Monsieur le Comte,' Franz replied, "'but we still have a thousand matters to attend to.' "'What matters?' "'We have no disguises, and today a disguise is obligatory.' "'Don't worry about that. "'I believe that we have a private room at the Piazza del Popolo. "'I shall have any costumes that you require brought there, "'and we shall put on our masks as we go.' "'After the execution?' Franz cried. Of course, after, during, before, as you wish. In front of the scaffold? The scaffold is part of the entertainment. Excuse me, Count, said Franz. I've been thinking. I am most grateful to you for your generosity to us, and I shall be happy to accept a place in your carriage and a seat at the window of the Palazzo Rospoli, and you can feel free to give my place at the window in the Piazza del Popolo to someone else. "'But I must warn you, you will be missing something well worth seeing,' the Count replied. "'You will tell me about it afterwards,' Franz went on. "'I am certain that the story will impress me almost as much from your mouth as it would, as, as it would if I were to see the events myself. "'In any case, I have more than once thought about watching an execution, "'but I have never been able to make, my, make up my mind to it. "'What about you, Albert?' "'I did once.' said the Vicomte. I saw them execute Cast Castain, but I think I was a little drunk that day. It was on my last day at school, and we spent the night in some cabaret or other. Come now, just because you have not done something in Paris, that is no reason for not doing it abroad. When one travels, one does so to learn. A change of place should mean a change of scenery. Imagine how you will look when people ask you, how do they ex execute criminals, and r criminals in Rome, and you have to answer, I don't know. Then they say that the condemned man is an infamous rogue, a maniac who took a gridiron and beat to death a good priest who had brought him up as his own son. Just think, when you kill a man of the cloth, you should at least use more appropriate implement than a gridiron, especially when this priest could be your father. If you were travelling through Spain, you would go and see a bullfight, wouldn't you? Well, imagine that we are going to see a fight. Imagine the ancient Romans and their circus, those wild beast hunts in which they killed three hundred lions and a hundred men. Remember the eighty thousand spectators clapping their hands, the virtuous, mat the virtuous matrons who would take their unmarried daughters, and those delightful vestal virgins whose pure white hands would give a charming little sign with the thumb that meant, come on, don't be lazy, finish him off, that man who is already three quarters dead. Are you going, Albert? Franz asked. Certainly, my dear fellow. I was like you, but the Count's eloquence has convinced me. Well then, let's go if that's what you want, Franz said. But on my way to the Piazza del Popolo, I want to go by the Corso. Can we do that, Count? On foot we can, but not in the carriage. In that case, I'll go on foot. Do you have to go by the Corso? Yes, there is something I, uh, there I need to see. Then let's go by the Corso and send the carriage by the Strada del Babuino to wait for us at the Piazza del Popolo. As it happens, I shall not be sorry to go down to the Corso to see, some, see if some orders I gave have been carried out. Uh, Excellency, the servant said, opening the door, a man dressed as a penitent has come to see you. Ah, yes, said the Count, I know who that is. 
Gentlemen, pray go back into the drawing room, where you will find some excellent Havana cigars on the table. I shall join you shortly. The two young men got up and went out through one door, while the Count, after excusing himself again, went out of the other. Albert, who was a keen smoker and considered it no small sacrifice, since he had come to Italy, to have been deprived of the cigars that he smoked in Paris, went over to the table and exclaimed with joy on discovering some genuine puros. So, Franz asked him, what do you think of the Count of Monte Cristo? What do I think? Albert said, clearly astonished that his friend should even ask such a question. I think he is a charming man, a wonderful host, someone who has seen a lot, studied a lot, and thought a lot, who belongs like Brutus to the Stoic school, and, he added, allowing a voluptuous puff of smoke to escape from his lips and spiral up towards the ceiling, someone who, in addition to all that, has the most excellent cigars. This was Albert's opinion. And, since Franz knew that Albert claimed not to form any opinion on either men or things except after giving it deep thought, he did not try to change this one. But, he said, have you noticed something unusual? What's that? How closely he looks at you. At me? Yes, at you. Albert thought for a moment. Ah! he said with a sigh. There's nothing surprising about that. I have been away from Paris for nearly a year, and I must be dressed in the most outlandish fashion. I expect the Count mistook me, from a proven uh, mistook me for a provincial. Please, take the first opportunity, I beg you, to tell him that this is not so. Franz smiled. A moment later, the Count came back. Here I am, gentlemen, he said, entirely at your disposal. I've given the orders. The carriage will go to the Piazza, de, the Piazza del Popolo by its route, and we by ours, along the Corso, if you wish. Please help yourself to some of those cigars, Monsieur de Morcerf. By Gad, yes, with great pleasure, said Albert, because those Italian cigars of yours are even worse than the ones sold by the state monopoly at home. When you come to Paris, I shall have the opportunity to repay you for all this. I shall not refuse your invitation. I hope to go to Paris one day, and since you give me leave to do so, I shall knock on your door. Now, messieurs, come, we have no time to lose. It is half past twelve. Let's be going. All three went downstairs. There the coachman took his master's latest orders and set off down the Via del Babuino, while the pedestrians went up through the Piazza di Spagna and along the Via Fratina which led them directly between the Palazzo Fiano and the Palazzo Rospoli. Franz kept looking at the windows of the latter. He had not forgotten the signal agreed in the Colosseum between the man in the cloak and the Trastevere. Which windows are yours? he asked the Count in the most natural manner he could. The last three, he replied, with an entirely unaffected lack of concern for he could not have guessed the reason for the question. Franz immediately looked at the windows. Those on each side were hung with yellow damask, and the one in the middle in white damask with a red cross. The man in the cloak had kept his word to the other, and there was no longer any doubt. The man in the cloak was the Count. The three windows were still empty. Meanwhile, on all sides, preparations were being made. Chairs were being set out, scaffolding put up, and windows decorated. The masks could appear, and the carriages start to drive around only at the sound of a bell, but you could sense the masks behind every window, and the carriages behind every door. Franz, Albert, and the Count continued on their way down the Corso. As they approached the Piazza del Popolo, the crowd became more dense, and, above the heads of the people, they could see two things. The obelisk, surmounted by a cross that stands in the centre of the square, and in front of the obelisk, precisely at the point where the lines of sight of the three streets, Babuino, Corso and Ripetta, meet, the two highest beams of the scaffold, with, burning between them, the rounded blade of the mandaya. 
they met the Count's steward at the corner of the street, waiting for his master. The window that had been hired at what was doubtless an exorbitant price, which the Count had not wished to communicate to his guests, was on the second floor of the great palazzo, between the Via del Babuino and the Monte Pincio. It was a sort of dressing room opening onto a bedroom. By closing the bedroom door, the inhabitants of the dressing room could be on their own. Clowns, costumes in white and blue satin, most elegantly cut, had been laid across the chairs. As you left the, the choice of costumes to me, the Count told the two friends, I had these made for you. Firstly, they are the best that will be worn this year, and then they are the most convenient design for confetti, because flour doesn't show up on them. Franz took in what the Count was saying only very partially, and may not have appreciated this new mark of courtesy at its true value, for all his attention was drawn by the spectacle of the Piazza del Popolo and the awful implement that on this occasion was its chief ornament. It was the first time that Franz had seen a guillotine. We say guillotine because the Roman mandaia is constructed on more or less the same pattern as our instrument of death, the only difference being that the knife is shaped like a crescent, cutting with the convex part of the blade, and falls from less of a height. Two men, seated on the tipping plank on which the condemned person lies, were waiting and eating a lunch that, as far as France could make out, consisted of bread and sausage. One of them lifted the plank and brought out a flagon of wine from under it, took a drink and passed it to his companion. These two men were the executioner's assistants. Just looking at them, Franz felt the sweat burst out at the roots of his hair. The condemned prisoners had been brought the previous evening from the Carcere Nuove to the little church of Santa Maria del Popolo, and had spent the night, each attended by two priests, in a chapel of rest, secured with an iron grating, and in front of which sentries marched, being relieved at every hour. A double row of carabinieri extended from each side of the church door to the scaffold, widening out on reaching it to leave a path some ten feet across, and around the guillotine a clear space of some hundred yards in circumference. The whole of the rest of the square was carpeted with the heads of men and women. Many of the women had children seated on their shoulders. These children, who were a good head and shoulders above the rest of the crowd, would have an excellent view. The Monte Pincio seemed like a huge amphitheatre with all of its terraces crowded with spectators. The balconies of the two churches at the corners of the Via del Babuino and the Via di Ripetta were overflowing with privileged onlookers. The steps of the peristyles had the appearance of a swelling many-coloured waves, driven, driven towards the portico by the flow of an unceasing tide. Every protuberance on the wall capable of supporting a man had a living statue attached to it. So what the Count said was true. There is no more interesting spectacle in life than the spectacle of death. And yet, instead of the silence that the solemnity of the occasion would seem to demand, a great noise rose from the crowd, a noise made up of laughter, booing and joyful cries. It was clear, as the Count had also said, that the execution was nothing more for, for the people than the start of the carnival. Suddenly the noise ceased, as if by enchantment. The church door had just opened. First to appear was a company of penitents, each of them dressed in a grey sack which covered him entirely except for the holes for the eyes, and each holding, a <clears throat> each holding a lighted candle in his hand. At the front marched the head of the order. Behind the penitents came a tall man. He was naked except for linen trunks, on the left side of which was attached a huge knife concealed in its scabbard. Over his shoulder he carried a heavy iron mace. This man was the executioner. He also had sandals fastened around the lower part of the leg with thongs. Behind the executioner, in the order in which they were to be executed, came Peppino, then Andrea. Each of them was accompanied by two priests. 
Neither of them was blindfolded. Peppino was walking with quite a firm step. No doubt he had been told what to expect. Andrea was supported under each arm by a priest. From time to time, each of them would kiss the crucifix that a confessor held out to him. At the mere sight of this, Franz felt his legs ready to fold under him. He looked at Albert. The latter had gone as white as his shirt and mechanically tossed away his cigar, even though it was only half smoked. Only the Count appeared impassive. More than that, a faint blush of red seemed to be appearing beneath the livid pallor of his cheeks. His nose was dilating like that of a wild beast at the smell of blood, and his lips, slightly parted, showed his white teeth, as small and sharp as a jackal's. Yet, despite that, his face had an expression of smiling tenderness that France had never before seen on it. His black eyes, above all, were compellingly soft and lenient. Meanwhile, the two condemned men continued to proceed towards the scaffold, and as they approached one could make out their faces. Peppino was a handsome young man of between twenty-four and twenty-six, with a wild and free look on his sunburnt face. He carried his head high, and seemed to be sniffing the wind to see from which direction his liberator would come. Andrea was short and fat. His face was mean and cruel, of no definite age, though he was probably about thirty. He had let his beard grow in prison. His head was falling over on one shoulder, and his legs were giving way beneath him. His whole being appeared to be driven by some mechanical force in which his own will no longer played any part. "'I thought you told me,' Franz said to the Count, that there would be only one execution. That was the truth, he replied coldly. But there are two condemned men here. Yes, but of those two, one is at the point of death, while the other one has yet many has many years yet to live. It would seem to me that if a pardon is to come, there is not much time to be lost. And it is coming. Look, said the Count. Just as Peppino reached the foot of the Mandaya, a penitent, who seemed like a late arrival, broke through the wall of soldiers without them attempting to stop him, and, going up to the head of the order, gave him a sheet of paper folded in four. Peppino's sharp eyes had missed none of this. The head of the order unfolded the paper, read it, and raised his hand. The Lord be blessed and his ho the Lord be blessed and his holiness be praised he said loudly and clearly. There is a pardon for the life of one of the condemned prisoners. A pardon! the crowd cried in unison. There is a pardon! At this word, pardon, Andrea seemed to stiffen and raise his head. A pardon for whom? he cried. Peppino remained silent, motionless, panting. There is a pardon from the death penalty for Peppino, Elias Rocca Priori, said the head of the order, and he passed the sheet of paper to the captain in charge of the carabinieri, who read it and headed it back, handed it back. "'A pardon for Peppino?' yelled Andrea, entirely roused from the state of torpor into which he had seemed to be plunged. "'Why a pardon for him and not for me? We were to die together. I was promised that he would die before me. You have no right to make me die alone. I don't want to die alone!' and he broke away from the two priests, twisting, shouting, bellowing, and making insane efforts to break the ropes binding his hands. The executioner made a sign to his two assistants, who jumped off the scaffold and seized the prisoner. "'What's wrong?' Franz asked the Count. "'What is wrong?' the Count repeated. "'Don't you understand? What's wrong is that this human being who is about to die is furious because his fellow creature is not dying with him, and if he were allowed to do so, he would tear him apart with his nails and his teeth, rather than leave him to enjoy the life of which he himself is about to be deprived. Oh, men, men, race of crocodiles, as Karl Moore says, the Count exclaimed, brandishing his two clenched fists towards the heads of the crowd. 
How well I know you by your deeds, and how invariably you succeed in living down to what one expects of you. Andrea and the two assistant executioners was rolling around in the dust, the prisoner still crying out, He must die! I want him to die! You do not have the right to kill me alone! Look, look, the Count continued, grasping each of the two young men by the hand. Look, because I swear to you, this is worthy of your curiosity. Here is a man who was resigned to his fate, who was walking to the, to the scaffold and about to die like a coward, that's true, but at least he was about to die without, without resisting and without recriminations. Do you know what gave him that much strength? Do you know what consoled him? Do you know what resigned him to his fate? It was a fact that another man would share his anguish, that another man was to die like him, that another man was to die before him. Put two sheep in the slaughterhouse, or two oxen in the abattoir, and let one of them realise that his companion will not die, and the sheep will bleat with joy, the ox low with pleasure. But man, man whom God made in his image, man to whom God gave this first, this soul, this supreme law that he should love his neighbour, man to whom God gave a voice to express his thoughts, what is man's first cry when he learns that his neighbour is saved? A curse. All honour to man, the masterpiece of nature, the lord of creation. He burst out laughing, but such a terrible laugh that one realised he must have suffered horribly to be able to laugh in such a way. Meanwhile the struggle continued, and it was awful to watch. The two assistants were carrying Andrea onto the scaffold, but the crowd had taken against him, and twenty thousand voices were crying, Death! Death! Franz stepped back, but the Count seized his arm and kept him in front of the window. "'What are you doing?' he said. "'Is this pity? In faith it is well placed. If you heard someone cry, "'Mad dog, you would take your gun, rush out into the street and kill the poor beast by shooting it point-blank, without mercy. Yet the animal would, after all's been, after all's said and done, be guilty of nothing more than have, having been bitten by another dog and doing the same as was done to it.' And yet now you are taking pity on a man who was bitten by no other man, but who killed his benefactor, and who now, unable to kill anyone else because his hands are tied, wants more than anything to see his companion in captivity, his comrade in misfortune, die with him. No, no, watch. The injunction was almost unnecessary. France was, as it were, mesmerised by the horrible scene. The two assistants had carried the condemned man onto the scaffold, and there, despite his efforts, his bites and his cries, they had forced him to his knees. Meanwhile, the executioner had taken up his position on one side and raised the mace. Then, on a sign, the two assistants stepped aside. The prisoner wanted to get to his feet, but before he had time to do so, the club struck him on the left temple. There was a dull, muffled sound. The victim fell like a stricken bull, face downwards, then on the rebound turned over on his back. At this, the executioner dropped his mace, pulled the knife out of his belt, cut open his throat with a single stroke, and immediately stepping on his belly, began as it were to knead the body with his feet. At each stamping of the foot, a jet of blood spurted from the condemned man's neck. This time Franz could bear it no longer. He flung himself backwards into the room and collapsed on a chair, half senseless. Albert, with his eyes closed, remained standing, but only because he was clasping the curtains. The Count stood upright and triumphant, like an avenging angel. And on that cheerful note, <laughs> I think we shall uh, um, shall finish there. <laughs>